Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, the first week of the synagogue shooting trial is done, and we're feeling a lot of big feelings about all the news coverage. A know-nothing celebrity kicked rocks on Pittsburgh, but of course, we're fighting back. And I'm thinking maybe our local football stars have a bit of a vehicle curse. It's June 2nd, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I'm with CityCast Mallory Falk and Francesca DeBecco. Guys, we've had so much in studio time together this week. Have you recovered from all the donuts yesterday? <laughs> Maybe. Oh, it was a lot. Today is officially donut day. So if you guys missed it, be sure to check out yesterday's episode. We tried our best to try all of the donuts in Pittsburgh. And 21 think- donuts. We had 21 <laughs> donuts for Yins. And I pro tip, it looks like maybe some of these donut spots are offering discounts for National Donut Day. So check around and maybe you can get a half price donut or two. Well, I feel like some of us were eating our feelings leading up to today's uh, main topic. Um, The Pittsburgh Synagogue shooting trial kicked off earlier this week. Um, It's it's been a lot to try to engage with content on this. Yeah, the testimony kicked off Tuesday. We're not going to get into all the details of what happened, but we heard opening statements from both the prosecution and the defense, got a little bit of a sense of the defense strategy in this case, and started to hear from some of the witnesses, some of the people who survived the attack. And that attack, of course, October 27th, 2018, um, a synagogue in Squirrel Hill where 11 worshipers were killed, um, shot and killed. The facts of the case aren't in dispute, but we're in the guilt phase to determine what happens to the shooter. Yeah. And this is undeniably a really difficult time for the community, the people who were affected by it. Really, anybody in Pittsburgh who remembers when it happened, I think um, it's just a lot to take in. Well, and like a lot of our community, I think we're all kind of coming at it from different spaces. Mallory, it, it is your community, literally. You weren't yeah. in town when it happened. But I mean, I we've talked about this. I feel like that's almost worse because you didn't get to experience it in the community at yeah. the time. Yeah. This is, So I grew up um, in the Tree of Life Synagogue. My mom is a member of Dor Hadash, one of the other congregations. For those who don't remember, three different congregations met in the Tree of Life building. Um, And so three congregations were affected by the attack. All of them lost people. Um, And one thing that's been tough this week is just suddenly and unexpectedly encountering details from the trial. You know, when I open social media or go on to a news site, instead of being able to engage with this on my own timeline. So You know, I opened Twitter the other day and there were some photos that had been submitted as evidence in the trial, including one of the Bima, kind of the altar. Um, And it was just seeing this image of that was, you know, where I stood and had my bat mitzvah. It was it showed like the ark that the um, Torah is held in. And I like removed the Torah from there the first time I read from it. Um, Mm -hmm. And so just, yeah, scrolling through and kind of seeing this image that used to be so much connected to joy and tradition and observance. And now knowing it's an image that's being used in a, in a federal trial for a federal hate crime and murder case. For the death penalty, just, potentially. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so jarring and hard to know what to do with when you're seeing it without having kind of set aside that time to intentionally take it in and process it. I'm so sorry, Mallory. Like personally, just (laughs) this week, I kind of avoided reading a lot of the details of the updates um, early on in the week. And I feel a little guilty about it. I feel like it's my duty to, you know, sort of absorb as much information as I can and pick out the most important parts for our readers and help them digest this really troubling news. You know, I'm not in the courtroom. I'm not reporting, but I'm, I'm trying to keep the community informed. Anyway, I feel like I really need to t- take some time and space, like you said, Mallory, to really like sit with the stories. They're just really heart wrenching. And Megan, I know for you, um, you know, this isn't a community you grew up in, but you were covering um, this the shooting in the aftermath at the time. And yeah, what's it like to kind of revisit all of that? I don't know. I I, th- I think I'm disassociating a little bit. I mean. I- 
I, I don't I don't think any of us are grieving or mourning or absorbing all of this energy in our town in isolation or in competition. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, we're all having this experience together and in different ways and at different levels. And sometimes that level changes minute to minute. Um, I don't know. It's it's just a lot to take in. And I think that's kind of why we wanted to create space here to talk about that. Doesn't um, it also feel like a weird dichotomy? Like it's the summertime, you know, pride is kicking off this weekend. We have the arts festival. There's all of this time where like the city really comes alive, but yet so much of us are kind of, there's also, a big cloud over all yeah, of it. Yeah. Well, and I think for me, at least part of what's a contributing to this is because so much of my circle does exist in journalism spaces. And a lot of those people are in the room doing the play by play coverage um, and they're doing a great job. But that's not the kind of media I typically consume. I don't know how that's hitting y'all. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because seeing these kind of constant play by play updates, it does feel challenging. Um, but it's important, too, because, you yeah, know, I mean, this yeah. isn't just a Pittsburgh story. It's a national right. one. Th that's right. exactly what I was going to say is that, you know, first and foremost, the story, this trial is about, you know, the harm that was caused to the victims, to people who lost loved ones that day, to people who survived this attack, expanding out from there, you know, the larger Pittsburgh Jewish community. But this is also this huge national story. It's the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history. Um, and it also connects to so many threads that are so important in our country right now. Um, you know, this was an anti-Semitic attack. It was also an anti-immigrant attack. One of the things that the you know defense brought up in opening statements was they're making this argument that this attack wasn't actually about hatred toward Jews, that the alleged gunman like doesn't want refugees replacing white people in this country. And because one of the congregations, Dor Hadash, was working with an organization, Hayas, that works on refugee resettlement, this attack was about stopping them from helping refugees. Though like the great replacement theory, this idea that non-white people are coming in to replace white people in this country is inherently an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. It's a long-standing conspiracy theory that Jews are funding this, that Jews are behind this replacement. And I think, you know, one of the defense's argument is it also shows how nonsensical this attack is, um, how illogical. But to me, this feels like the logical conclusion of this kind of rhetoric. And I remember when this first happened, like one of my first thoughts was we knew this was coming. We saw people marching through the streets in Charlottesville saying Jews will not replace us. Mm -hmm. I was shocked that of all the Jewish communities and all the congregations in the U.S., this happened at my congregation at the synagogue I grew up in. Yeah. But I was not shocked that it happened. And you know, we've seen other attacks that were fueled by the Great Replacement Theory, Christchurch in New Zealand, um, the shooting that targeted black folks at a grocery store in Buffalo. And uh, less than a year after the attack here, there was a mass shooting in El Paso, where I was living at the time. That was the deadliest attack on Latinos in U.S. history. And there was this wave of anti-immigrant political rhetoric before both of those shootings. And so yeah. I think like... This story, like I said, first and foremost is about the harm that was caused to the specific people um, who lived through or lost loved ones in the attack. But it's about it's also about this moment in our country and touches on so much. And so it feels like this coverage um, is so critical because this is so much bigger than than just something that happened in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think my initial thought was like it would be easier to engage with if maybe there was a pool writer or something like that, like one specific person dedicated mm -hmm. to the room. But like, how would you ever pick? And at that point, are you gatekeeping the information that's able to be shared? Because, you know, every writer in that room is coming with a different lived experience, a different perspective, right. a different understanding of the events as they experience them that day. Um, the Jewish Chronicle in particular here in Pittsburgh has been doing just incredible work. Mm -hmm. Incredible. While uh, feeling these feelings Ugh. on such a deep level. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to them. Go and read their work. They're doing a phenomenal job. And I think, you know, one way that they are also serving their community is offering ways and resources for help. 
you know, it's really, it's really important right now to show up for our, our community. So there is a good story with um, a, a bunch of resources about uh, ways to deal with the trauma, you know, resources, organizations, uh, we'll link that in the show notes. Um, but if you want to get involved to the Squirrel Hill Stands Against Violence organization, uh, they're organizing for gun control. They're partnering with Ceasefire PA um, and they work closely with Moms Demand Action. Um, so that's a national organization uh, dedicated to uh, gun control. So, um, you know, they're definitely, you know, these are the ways that they're coping and they're trying to take action and, and we can all do our part by supporting them and supporting those organizations. And if you're feeling affected yourself, you can also reach out to the 1027 Healing Partnership. They've been doing amazing work really since day one, especially around mental health and like how to cope and and work through your feelings around this. Yeah. And I know they have drop in counseling available every weekday during the trial and, you know, individual counseling trauma support group. Um, all of the details and resources about that you can find either on their website or that Jewish Chronicle article that Francesca mentioned that we'll be sure to have in our show notes. We also spoke to them um, back in October at the four year mark of the attack, and, and their director talked about, you know, anticipating the trial coming up and reminding people. You don't need to learn every detail, follow every step of the coverage if that's something that's harmful to you. I mean, I know, Francesca, you talked about the sense of duty and obligation, um, but that I just remember her stressing like it's OK to disconnect sometimes. It's OK yeah. not to read every detail that comes out every day. Um, and so I think just a reminder to all of us to choose how and when we want to engage with this to the degree that we can and however you choose to engage is okay. Hey, CityCast Pittsburgh, it's Michael Zibiak. While CityCast Pittsburgh works hard every day to connect you with the stories that matter most, I'm working in the background making sure that our listeners are connecting with the best that Pittsburgh has to offer. So what does that look like? It means meeting with the people who make Pittsburgh what it is. The business owners, the stakeholders, the decision makers, the Pittsburghers who put together those food festivals you enjoy, the concerts you attend, the exhibits you can't miss, and who make those candles your mom can't stop talking about. If this sounds like you, let me help you get your message out to the city's best audience with an ad right here on the CityCast Pittsburgh podcast and on our sister daily newsletter, Hey Pittsburgh. Shoot me an email at ads at citycast.fm and let's connect. So we're going to make a hard left turn here. This has been a pretty heavy week in Pittsburgh, and we want to send you into the weekend with some lighter, funnier stories. Mallory, um, is that a, a, a hard Pittsburgh left turn? <laughs> yeah, we're going to make a kind, a thoughtful Pittsburgh left for you. Uh, I don't know if the story is all that kind or thoughtful, but no, I'll let you do that. <laughs> the story is not so kind, but we're trying to be kind to our yes, listeners. Yes. Um, are either of you familiar with Scandival? No, I know that he's a person that is on Vanderpump Rules and it broke my social media for a minute, but I've never watched the show. No clue. Please inform me. Sure. So I'm not going to dive into all the details, both because I don't watch Vanderpump Rules <laughs> and this isn't a celebrity gossip podcast, though there is <laughs> certainly a place for those. Um, but this guy, Tom Sandoval, he is one of the main players on Vanderpump Rules. He was involved in like a cheating scandal with a castmate. It broke the Internet, like you said, Megan, a couple of months ago, I believe. That's kind of all you need to know about that story. He's like a reality TV celeb who came under fire for his love life. Um, but where this becomes a Pittsburgh story is that apparently over Memorial Day weekend, he was flying to Pittsburgh. He's in a band. They had a show here. And uh, TMZ broke the story that apparently he was talking on the phone to somebody. A passenger overheard him. And he said he was heading for fucking Pittsburgh, which I don't <laughs> oh know gosh. if that was actually the delivery, but uh, <laughs> I, if TMZ is doing a story about it. <laughs> this is the one time I like it when you editorialize. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. 
Well, and I feel like it had to be in this really uh, derisive tone of voice because TMZ actually got a couple of Pittsburgh City Council people to no way. issue responses or oh comment on this. It must have been I a very slow story. day in council. Yeah, slow day in the <laughs> yeah. chambers. Clearly nothing was on the bail that day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or maybe we have some council people who've just, their dream has been to be in a, a, a TMZ a article. Brag. I mean, honestly, that is like, that is like part of the bingo card, I feel like. That's a good one. Sure. <laughs> and uh, end up in one, but not for their own scandal. Right, right, yeah. So so Anthony Coghill told TMZ, he clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. Has he ever set foot in Pittsburgh? And then also kind of had to burn Tom Sandoval by saying, I never heard of the guy, never heard of his show. Um, <laughs> but I most appreciated Bobby Wilson's comment. He oh, says, my representative. Um, yeah, well, he said uh, it's unfortunate somebody who is having relationship problems is trying to take a swing at Pittsburgh. Why bring us down? Work on yourself. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. I like that. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Sienna Miller thing from way back when. Um, I remember when I moved here, people were still so pissed about it, but it had happened like years before. I mean, Megan, to this day, I will not support this woman. <laughs> and it's been almost 20 years. This <laughs> happened in 2006. I feel bad that I didn't know about this. Uh, being a lifelong Pittsburgher, I feel like I should have known. But at the same time, I was like 10. So <laughs> what did she say again? I don't even remember. Yeah. So she was here uh, filming a movie adaptation of The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, classic Pittsburgh book. Michael Shabin, shout out. Um, yep. And uh, in an interview with Rolling Stone, she said something along the lines of like, Pittsburgh, more like Schittsburg. Oh, I mean, was it kind of then, though? I've heard I've heard very bad things about Pittsburgh uh, around the turn of the millennia. I mean, yeah, 2006 era Pittsburgh. Like, I can't necessarily say she was wrong, but this is the kind of thing you like tell your buddies in a group chat. You don't say it to a national magazine. You need to be gracious about the sit places that you're filming in. And clearly she didn't know just how strongly Pittsburghers feel about their city and that they would all revolt. I remember seeing a sign in a bar or something that said something about like Sienna Miller's not welcome here and just laughing so hard. Like, <laughs> what is that even about? I bet they still exist. Does somewhere. this come up a lot? Like, is she trying to get into your bar? <laughs> I mean, to this day, I don't think Sienna Miller could get served a drink in Pittsburgh, <laughs> at least not at any like legitimate old time Pittsburgh bar. I am finding like the rest of her quote. Um, she told the reporter, can you believe this is my life? Will you pity me when you're back in your funky <gasps> New York apartment and I'm still in Pittsburgh? I need to get more glamorous films and stop with my indie year. Whoa. Oh. OK, that's offensive. Wow. But then she said her quotes were taken out of context. Uh, and yeah, she finds sure. the city and its residents gracious. <laughs> Did she they say were not gracious to her? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I feel like this speaks to kind of the long tradition of celebrities weighing in on Pittsburgh, although almost everyone that I've seen reported on here locally has been pretty positive. Yeah. I remember, you know, Another actress who came to Pittsburgh to film an adaptation of another popular Pittsburgh novel, Emma Watson, who was in Hermione. The Mysteries. <laughs> Hermione yes. herself. Yes. She was here filming The Perks of Being a Wallflower. I remember the tunnel and scene. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the things she talked about was when she was in Pittsburgh, you know, she didn't really get a like traditional high school coming of age experience. And shooting that movie here in Pittsburgh and becoming really close with her castmates kind of felt like a stand-in for that. Oh. And I remember she told the New York Times that like she, that scene where she is in the back of a truck, standing and riding through the Fort Pitt tunnel, they really wanted a stunt person to do it. She insisted on it and that it just felt like this moment to mark, like I've gotten to have my coming of age experience. Oh. And she said it was one of the best nights of her life, oh. which is I just so touching. love that scene so much. I mean, it makes every person in Pittsburgh want to do the very thing. I know it's not really safe, but I'm no, so no glad one that do she that. got to it's, do that. No. It's terribly dangerous. Please don't do it. The please. fumes alone would be damaging. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh, yuck. I bet they shut the whole. Yeah, they definitely shut the tunnel down for that one. But. But uh, oh, I love that. I love that story. I love that she thinks of Pittsburgh so fondly um, and that memory and that scene. Another one that I really love, uh, Jeff Daniels, when he was here for American Rust. Um, Rich Fitzgerald's yeah, well, <laughs> well, that's a separate. Yeah. They took a picture next to Rich Fitzgerald and they 
do sort of favor a little bit, um, he and the county executive, but he had the nicest things to say about Pittsburgh. Um, he's a Michigan native. I don't know if you knew that, um, but he's like, Detroit's not that different. I grew up work- working class, working at my dad's lumber company. It felt like I was one of those guys. I'm completely paraphrasing. Um, but that, you know, he got to practice a Pittsburgh accent, which felt very like real to the show and tap into his own Midwestern roots. Um, but yeah, he said like the land has as much of a character as we are. Um, He shouts out all these places, talks about how great the bridge is and the natural settings were um, and just how appreciative he was of the good people of Pittsburgh for being like kind stewards, not just to him and the set, but also like to the land, because that's kind of what the show is about. Oh, that's so (laughs) sweet. I love that. Um, I have another charming review of Pittsburgh. So I love the series A League of Their Own on Prime Video. It came out last year. And while it was supposed to be based in Rockford, Illinois, like in in the show, um, the series was filmed here in Pittsburgh because of our, you know, rustic backdrop. Because Uh, we got a lot of old stuff lying around. Yeah, (laughs) we do. We do. Um, Good old (laughs) Schittsburg. So some of it was filmed at CCAC Boys Campus on and on East Carson Street on the south side. And actress Darcy Carden, uh, she plays one of the main characters, had this to say on Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah, we shot um, A League of Their Own in Pittsburgh this last summer. It's great like town. Amazon Prime. I love Pittsburgh. I did too. Yeah, it's one of those you're like, wow, Pittsburgh is great. I, it, yeah. it was like, I feel like the most common It's called thing. Pittsburgh. It's yes. like the worst name totally. imaginable. But the most common phrase was like, it's actually really cute. <laughs> that should be there. They're like How condescending, but I yes. I... But I loved it, loved it. She's not wrong. Like, that's the number one thing I hear when people come to visit Pittsburgh is sort of the shock in their voice. Yeah. The Every time. It's, really it's nice actually here. really it's cute. Pretty. They're right. That could be our tourism slogan. Yeah, they're so <laughs> right. So she went on to say that, you know, she plays baseball. She's really pretty good at it. And while she was here, she actually got to throw out the first pitch at the Pirates game. And it was one of her dreams, like on her bucket list of things to do. <laughs> um, so I thought that was really fun. Uh, but she actually threw out the pitch to the Pirate Parrot. <laughs> I feel like that would throw me off personally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the actually cute thing. Um, one more before we close out uh, was Steve Carell recently was on the Office Ladies podcast. Um, my partner is a dedicated listener and it's where like the women who played the characters of Pam and Angela are going through literally every episode of the show and giving you like the behind the scenes dirt. Um, but they're asking Steve Carell like just random questions. And one of them, well, I'll just play the tape. Favorite place you've visited in the United States? Pittsburgh was pretty cool. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that ironically either. I, I, I've done a couple of movies there, and I liked it. It was a cool city. All right. There you go. I bet that's the first one you got. Shout out to Pittsburgh. Shout out to Pittsburgh. I love that because I think... You know, with the exception of maybe Sienna Miller, generally, if someone's asked about the place they're filming in, they're going to be gracious. They're going to find something nice to say about it. Um, But you might not know how they actually feel. And this just feels like it's so genuine, like of all the places for him to bring up Pittsburgh, which is not a place where he was just here filming something. No, that was back in 2014 that he was the most recent shoot. So he went out of his way to compliment us. That's so sweet. I know. So let's close it out on another mostly lighter story to take you into the weekend. The Steelers' new quarterback, Kenny Pickett, had his car stolen. Did y'all hear about this? I think KDK had it first. I did not. Oh, my gosh. He was at a Bowser Chevrolet in Monroeville um, while he was doing some promotional stuff. And someone snatched the car. But the biggest thing to me is that the playbook, the Steelers' official playbook, was in the car when it got taken. <laughs> no. <laughs> Have they recovered it? Yeah. yeah the Steelers said that um, they did know that it was there, but it has been recovered. Um, but gosh, like, can you imagine if you were, I mean, the, the alleged thief is in custody. But can you imagine if you realized that you had something that valuable? Like, the car is one thing. Can you imagine the pretty penny you could get for the Steelers playbook? Wow, they better put like some sort of lock and key fingerprint password on on that binder. (laughs) It reminded me of, do you remember a few years ago when Juju Smith-Schuster had his own (laughs) theft problem? Someone took his bicycle. Oh, that's right. Oh, I remember because, um, you know, the brand Steel City who makes the T-shirts, mm-hmm. they had a um, a T-shirt made where it was Juju's bike, but like the E.T. 
like E.T. going over the moon. Oh, my gosh. Um, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was it was a great T-shirt. Um, I don't know if maybe they'll spin off on the <laughs> Kenny Pickett car. But I know uh, the the bicycle actually made it onto his cleats, too. I think it was um, also former Steeler, current artist here in Pittsburgh, Baron Batch, right. um, did specialty cleats that depicted his beloved bicycle on them. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this reminds me of a slightly different story, which was that uh, during the final season of Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston, who played the lead on that show, his car was broken into in Albuquerque and someone stole um, like a, one of the final scripts Whoa. from his car. Oh. And it never got leaked. Like this guy, I think, got picked up before it could get leaked. But there were rumors. I don't know if it was ever fully confirmed that the show's creator actually like changed some aspects of the season just in case. And so it makes me wonder if the Steelers are going to, I don't know, rewrite some of their plays just in case. <laughs> or I bet there's Pittsburghers. strategy. Yeah, I bet there's Pittsburghers out there with like conspiracy theories about like who stole it. It was like a, I don't know, like Ravens a Browns, or something. Yeah. A Browns, yes. <laughs> I haven't seen any reporting to suggest uh, any foul play. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I think that would be really funny, right? One more thing before we go, a reminder, we're still doing that audience survey to learn about our listeners. I promise it's really fast. We just need a few more people to take it and then we can stop doing this in your ear, I swear. Um, if you finish, you can enter to win that $250 Visa gift card. Um, so please take it. It's citycast.fm slash survey. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Our music is by Benji. Our producers this week are Mallory Falk and Maria Carter. Francesca DeBecco writes our newsletter, and I'm your host, Megan Harris. We'll be back on Monday with more news from around the city. Have a great week, Indians. All that's coming to my head is the... That's the power of Bowser.